Hello everybody and welcome to the Big Nature Debate here at the Natural History Museum. The debate was launched in September in an effort to raise a discussion and issue with the general public about the issues to do with biodiversity in the run-up to the Nagoya, the Nagoya Conference, COP10, the Conference of the Parties to the Convention of Biological Diversity. We undertook uh, some research through Mori, the well-known pollsters, and it raised a r number of issues. What it showed was that people were really concerned. People are concerned about the loss of, nat of the UK's species. They're concerned about the impact of climate change on global wildlife. And also they're concerned about overfishing. But importantly, and what was surprising to us, is that we found in that survey that 85% of those people po um, polled didn't know that there was going to be an important meeting later this year in Japan, 193 countries coming together to talk about the issues of biodiversity. Not just to talk about the issues, but to make decisions. Decisions about how we protect diversity, manage and make use of it. These decisions will affect everybody involved in uh, animal conservation or research institutes and the public, they'll affect us all for the decades to come. So the debate has been online for some time, since September, and we've had a really good range of participants. And we've been very pleased with the range of questions that have come to us. We've had blogs from the Partnership of International Bi Year of Biodiversity, and we have our eminent panel here today. I'd like to introduce to you, to my left, is Paul Smith, who is the head of the Millennium Seed Bank at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. Next to him is Professor Jonathan Bailey, the Conservation Programmes Director at the Zoological Society of London, ZSL. Next to Jonathan is Bob Watson, Professor Bob Watson, who's the Chief Scientific Advisor of the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, known to most of us as DEFRA. Then we have Professor John Hutton, who is the Director of the World Conservation Monitoring Centre. And finally, Dr Chris Lyle, our own Chris Lyle, who is a research entomologist here at the Natural History Museum. So welcome everybody. My name is Sharon Amont. I'm Director of Public Engagement here. So my first question, or not my first question, the first question that came from the um, online discussions, and this has been raised by others, uh, by many, but amongst whom, Wallflower <coughs> from the Big Nature debate. So the question is, I'm going to put this first of all to Paul and then to Bob. How do you explain biodiversity and its importance? Biodiversity oh. is, a, um, is short for biological diversity uh, and it embraces everything from microorganisms through to animals uh, and plants, fungi and so on. Uh, and it's important to us because we rely on it uh, in our everyday lives. You will have eaten biodiversity for breakfast, probably biodiversity from another country. Uh, you're probably wearing biodiversity if you have uh, clothes made of, of cotton. Uh, and I'm sure we're sitting under biodiversity here in, in, in a sense um, uh, of construction and building materials. So it provides us um, with everything that we need um, to, to live. Yes, I agree. It's the diversity of life. It's diversity in the genetic makeup of different species. It's the diversity among species. And it's the diversity even in the ecosystem, the ensemble of species. And why is it important? Just as has been said, we rely on it. It underpins human well-being. There are provisioning services, the provisioning of food, the provisioning of clean water, the provisioning of energy, the provisioning of medicines. There's the regulating services, which are biodiversity underpins, regulating the climate, regulating air quality, water quality, pollination services, 
There's cultural services, aesthetic value, religious value, uh, recreational value, and then there's what I call the underlying maintenance services, soil formation, uh, for our biogeochemical cycling. So we humans, it is important both the innate value, the innate value of species, genetic variation, but it underpins human society. Without it, we would not survive. And Chris, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I think there's, a, there's another question here, because the question is, how do you explain it? And we've heard very good what it is. There's also a bit of slightly scary on how you go about explaining it. It's a bit of a worrying term for people, and we've seen that on, on some of the website comments. And I think one of the important things as we go forward is that people really not only understand what it is, but understand that it's important to them. There's almost an emotional response. So, if you like, one of the ways that, that I explain, you heard somebody just now, is I tell stories. I creep up on people and explain it. I work a lot with kids, and all you have to do is to say, hey, look at that, and you're away, and you're beginning to talk about biodiversity, the variation that, that, that you see around it. So there's a, if you like, there's an easy way of creeping up of telling people about what it is and helping them to be engaged in it, engaged in, it in, a, in, a, in an important way. Yes. Well, if I could just add that I think <clears throat> that biodiversity is actually a very difficult concept for most people. And, I, and if you look at some of the research which has been done with the public, there was a study uh, from the Cairngorms, Cairngorms National Park, two or three years ago. And while the public did recognise things like eagles and crossbills and other finches as biodiversity, they also thought that biodiversity was something to do with uh, dry stone walls and old buildings and castles. Mm -hmm. So it was clear from that study that um, in many ways, I think what has happened is the scientists tried to, we, we tried to create a, a construct so that biodiversity could have dimensions and we could measure it and we could try and portray it uh, as important to decision makers because actually it's getting beaten around. Uh, but in so doing, I think we forgot, a, forgot the need for that simple message to the public. And it's clear the public themselves, I think, are using biodiversity they're getting used to the term, but they use it as a, a metaphor for, for what they used to call nature. Mm. So there is, I think, a bit of a disjoint between the public and, and scientists on, on, on how we think about biodiversity. Okay. Okay, Jonathan. Well, I think um, we can think about it a completely different way in a sense that we are part of biodiversity and we always try and separate ourselves from it. But we have to realize that our ancestors actually spent millions of years in the oceans with the other primitive forms of life, that we spent millions of years in the rainforests, that we spent millions of years in the savannas, and that the rest of life is really part of who we are. In fact, we're related to it. And as we lose life, we're essentially losing a part of the building blocks that have made us human. 